Well, Shalom, my name is Todd Bennett, and this is the weekly audio recording of the Shammai Israel newsletter titled, Counting Beyond Shavuot Toward a Circumcised Heart. Well, this was originally published on day nine of month three on the Creator's calendar, also known as May 18th, 2024, on the Roman calendar. Uh, now, in the past week, we had celebrated Shavuot, which was 50 days after the first Rashid barley offering uh, was made by the priest. That is, if there was an operating temple or a, or a tabernacle or a mishkan, uh, that would have occurred 50 days prior to Shavuot. Through the writings of Josephus and Philo, we know that this is how the Omer was counted during Yeshua's time. We can also discern how the Israelites counted when they left Egypt. The children of Israel reached Mount Sinai three days before Shavuot. And the text of Exodus 19.1 carries a clue that they arrived at Sinai on the same day that they left Egypt. Well, we know they left Egypt on the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the year 1437 BCE. Do you know what day of the week that was? Well, using Torah calendar as a tool, we can see that it was the first day of the week, commonly called Sunday. That same day in month three that they arrived in Sinai was therefore day five of month three. Uh, it was the first day of the week, again, uh, commonly called Sunday. And that's the clue that helps us to really calibrate uh, when they left and when they arrived at Sinai. We then read the following. Yahuwah said to Moshe, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, Yahuwah will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. We'll notice now the emphasis on the third day. Well, that refers to the third day of the week, commonly called Tuesday. So on the third day, Yahuwah came down on the mountain. It was also the 50th day of the Omer count. We know this not simply because of tradition. We know it because we can look back at the year 1437 BCE and count the days ourselves. Can you do that with the calendar you're currently using? Well, I'm talking to a lot of people who I assume use the Torah calendar, which simply uses the sun and the moon as prescribed by uh, Genesis 1.14. So again, I assume you all use the sun and the moon and can do this. Uh, but ask your friends uh, who are chasing after rogue Dead Sea calendars if they can. The answer is likely no, they cannot because they are solar calendars, number one. And there's no way to utilize uh, the current Dead Sea scroll calendar to go back in time, essentially, and look at these things. Whereas Torah calendar just simply uses the uh, motions of the sun and the moon, there are known uh, movements, and it basically just uses those, uh, those uh, algorithms, and you can essentially travel through time because we're just using uh, the sun and the moon, and we know their positions, and we can go back and forth uh, from the past to the future to the present and, and make these determinations. And that's the beauty of just following Yah's simple commandments and using the sun and the moon. We know that Yah came down on the 50th day. Therefore, Shavuot was, has always been connected with the ten words spoken by Yahuwah and the further instructions given to Moses uh, on the mountain. So the Torah is very much associated with Shavuot. And interestingly, while the uh, word Shavuot literally means sevens, Christians celebrate Pentecost, which means 50th. They understand that the event described in Acts 2 was an important event, but few connect it with an appointed time that spans back to Sinai. Most treat it as a brand new Christian holiday. Uh, well, Western Christianity will observe Pentecost a Sunday, which is actually today, the day I'm uh, recording this, May 19th, while Eastern Orthodox Christians will celebrate it on June 9th. Uh, both observe it seven weeks after their Easter Sunday celebrations. 
Uh, so they understand the weeks, they understand the sevens, but they call it Pentecost. And sadly, they never give the Torah a thought in their celebrations. Instead, they focus on the spiritual aspect of the promise of the Father. And we'll, But without the Torah, many assemblies end up looking like the Wild West as people get consumed with operating in the gifts of the Spirit as a means to an end. Most fail to make the connection between Sinai and Jerusalem, which is why many will appear before Yeshua proclaiming, Lord, Lord, uh, but will be rejected. And we read about that in Matthew seven twenty one through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Some translations say workers of iniquity. In either case, that's uh, a reference to anomia, which means without the law, without the Torah. Let me rephrase that. Not everyone who calls Yeshua Lord will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I can hear many Christians saying, but wait, my pastor told me that all I needed to do was believe in Jesus and say a prayer, raise my hand, whatever the formula is for a particular denomination. Well, we've discussed this so many times that I'm sure the answer is clear to every reader of this message. It's not what you say, but rather what you do. You cannot simply call Yeshua Lord or Master or even Messiah. You must do the will of the Father in heaven. And his will is set forth in the Torah. Again, if you call somebody your Master, well, that means you're submitting to them. You're obeying them. And so, therefore, just calling somebody Master or Lord or Messiah or God, uh, you know, whatever the title you want to ascribe to them, just calling them that is meaningless if your actions do not actually confirm the fact that they are your, your master or your Lord. So there has to be a corresponding uh, action to those words. Well, these many people wanted power for their own edification. They, they neglected the fact that the power of the Spirit called the Helper was so that they could obey the instructions. The many were called lawless because they didn't obey. They, they didn't use the power for the intended purpose. This group of many sounds and acts like many Christians in the charismatic movement, dabbling in the pagan practice of ecstatic utterance under the guise of speaking in tongues. Just look that up if, you don't, if you're not familiar with that. They sound and act like many Christians who have invited the kundalini spirit into their congregations, rather than the saddest part spirit of Elohim. They do this because they are lawless and they cannot discern between the Kodesh and profane. Well, these many people fail to understand uh, the intended purpose of a restored people through the covenant. The people of Elohim are not called to perform miracles on a daily basis. Here's a description of our calling, according to Peter. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy set-apart nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of Elohim, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And of course, you know, this is right out of the Torah. You know, this is not, nothing new. Peter's basically uh, providing that you know, you are Israel. The, you know, the people that are filled with the Spirit and have been called into the light are Israel. And the end portion there in, in verse 10 is specifically referring to the lost sheep of the house of Israel who uh, had basically been disconnected from Elohim due to their sin. And we read about that in Hosea 1. So those who are chosen must focus on being set apart priests to Yahuwah in the light, which is his truth. We are to proclaim the praises of Elohim and worship him in spirit and truth. And that's what Yeshua told the Samaritan woman at the well. He says, but the hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. 
for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Elohim is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Well, do you remember where Yeshua made this statement? It's one of my many, uh, one of my favorite places uh, to visit in the land, Shechem. And here's the context uh, from John 4, 4 through 6. It says, and he had to pass through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sikar, and that is, that is Shechem, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Yeshua wearied, as he was from, uh, so Yeshua wearied as he, he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Um, sorry, I got a little uh, caught up in my thoughts because as I was reading, I was just thinking, you know, I don't know if people realize how significant that passage is because uh, we, there's the implication that Joseph was the, you know, given the firstborn status, and we know this from the blessings that were uh, given over him in in um, Egypt before his father died and the, that royal robe that he was given. But right here you've got, you know, it says near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. So you've got this field uh, uh, near Shechem, and we all know the story of when uh, Jacob, Israel, returned to the land, bought the field. They had the problem with Dinah and uh, the slaughtering of the males who were circumcised at Shechem. So that was the inheritance that would go to the firstborn. So the reason he gave it to Joseph was because Joseph had inherited that firstborn status. And that's really important to understand when we consider all these end-time prophecies and restoration and all this. That there's this sibling rivalry between Joseph and, um, and Judah. And that's, that we saw that from the, the split of the kingdom. Uh, after the death of Solomon, and it, it even carries on to this day. So Joseph has the rights to this land, not not the modern state of Israel. And, uh, you know, we're seeing these ancient uh, sibling rivalries even play out to this day. So anyways, it's just interesting. Many people just read over that, but it's, it's pretty significant because it acknowledges that that land called Samaria uh, belonged to Joseph. And the, so the, it's, a, it's important to understand that the focus was on Joseph. It was Joseph's field, it was Joseph's well, and Joseph's tomb was right there as well, nearby. So the focus is on Joseph and the lost sheep of the house of Joseph, and that's why the conversation quickly focused on the fact that she was an adulterous woman. Uh, Yeshua said, you have said, well, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you truly, you spoke truly. So in other words, Yeshua is acknowledging, look, you are an adulterous woman, and of course the house of Israel was expelled from the land because they were an adulterous bride to Yahuwah. So uh, this context is really quite profound. None of this was coincidence. He was speaking directly to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He was referring to the promised circumcision of the heart, uh, not attending, when he talked about worship, and not, not about attending a, a Christian event and raising your hands while you sing along with your favorite band or worship train, or your worship team. Moses, in fact, stated, Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked, no longer. In saying this, he was contrasting an uncircumcised heart uh, with being stiff-necked. And stiff-necked is Yahweh's way of describing people who will not respond to his yoke, his instructions. You know, the oxen are supposed to be have a yoke uh, 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 around their necks, and it doesn't have to be heavy. It's, uh, it's made of wood, and to an oxen it, it's meaningless, really, as far as any nuisance goes, but when the person driving the oxen tugs, you know, on the right or the left, they're supposed to feel that yoke tug, and they're supposed to act accordingly and move accordingly. Well, when you're stiff-necked, that you can feel, you can still feel it, but uh, you don't respond. You just don't, uh, you don't respond to it all, and maybe you can't even feel it after a while because you're so stiff-necked that uh, you don't even feel the yoke any longer. And that's what Yah is referring to when he calls his people stiff-necked people. We're supposed to sense the tugging of the Spirit and respond. 
and re removing the foreskin increases sensitivity and makes us more responsive, more obedient, which is an expression of our love and intimacy with Elohim. It was not a coincidence that Yahuwah placed the outward sign in the flesh upon the sexual organ of the male, which corresponds to the inner heart. Uh, while man can circumcise flesh, we need Yahuwah to circumcise our hearts, and that uh, is a promise that he will do. As in Deuteronomy 36, it says, And Yahuwah, your Elohim, will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your soul, which is nefesh in Hebrew, that you may live. Why do we need Yahuwah to circumcise our hearts? It's right there in the text, so that we can love him with all our heart and with all our nefesh. And that's the Shema, the first and greatest commandment, according to Yeshua. And we read about that in Matthew 22, 37 through 38, and Mark 12, 29 through 30, when people ask him, what's the greatest commandment? And he, based, he said, Shema Yisrael, Yehuah Yerolohim, Yehuah Echad. Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And our love is directly related to our obedience. And that obedience does not simply consist of, an, of our outward actions and speech. It needs to originate with the heart. In other words, like I said before, you know, your actions will uh, basically uh, reinforce what you say with your mouth. But it even goes a step further because you can... You can get up in the morning and say, well, I got to do this. Uh, oh, I got to do that. I, you, know, you know, God says that I have to do this and that, so I'll do it. But, you know, if you're begrudging, then you're really, you're, you're not doing it necessarily out of love, but out of uh, just obligation. And he doesn't want that from us. He wants us to love him and, and be joyful servants. And we should be when we realize the goodness and the greatness that he has given us and done for us and how every every breath that we take and every uh, heartbeat is is a gift from Elohim. We don't always look at life like that. We take a lot for granted. And so it's always helpful, you know, when you wake up to consider the fact that, well, the fact that you even woke up is a gift. You know, the fact that he kept your heart beating all night while you were sleeping and that he kept you breathing all night while you were sleeping and resting and, and regenerating and all of that was a gift and so we need to kind of what we say count our blessings i talked about that last week when we're counting we're taught to count and we just finished a count to shava oh and yet we need to count our blessings every day so anyways uh our actions you know and everything that we do needs to originally in the heart and he emphasized this point while in the land of the exiled house of Israel because those exiles needed to change while they were in exile. They needed a change in heart. And that's why Yeshua sent his disciples uh, to them with the good news. And here's, here's the promise given through Ezekiel to all these exiles that needed to return. It says, again, the word of Yahuwah came to me saying, Son of man, your brethren, your relatives, your countrymen, and all the house of Israel, in its entirety, and that's all 12 tribes, are those about whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get far away from Yahuwah. This land has been given to us as a possession. So in other words, people in the land are telling all of Israel to get away. This is our land. So Israel's in captivity, and somebody's there in the land, and they're saying, Stay out. It's ours. And that's an interesting uh, situation. Therefore say, thus says Adonai Yahuwah, although I have cast them far off among the nations, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet I shall be a little sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. Therefore thus says Adonai Yahuwah, I will gather you from the peoples, assemble you from the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And they will go there and they will take away all its detestable things and all its abominations from there. And I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. 
that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their Elohim. But as for those whose hearts follow the desire of their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their deeds on their own heads, says Adonai Yahuwah. Well, did you catch that verse 15, which I kind of commented on already? The inhabitants of Jerusalem will tell all the house of Israel to get far away because the land has been given to them as a uh, possession. And that's precisely what the Jewish Zionists are saying to nations who want to return. I've gone to Israel almost 60 times over the last uh, what's 24 years now. I go over for the appointed times, but, but guess what? Uh, they don't want me to live there. They won't allow me to live there, especially if I say I follow Yeshua as the Messiah. Now, if I converted to Judaism and, and became Jewish, and I say that in quotes, uh, they might let me move over there, but uh, not under the present circumstances, right? now. And I, and I could go over there and claim, well, but wait, I'm from Joseph. Uh, this is, you know, I want to move up into Samaria. I want to move into Shechem. I want to, you know, settle in the land that's my inheritance. Uh, they would say, are you kidding? Get out of here. You know, this is our land. You're not Jewish. So the Jews are uh, claiming exclusivity to Jerusalem and the land. and uh, But that's going to change. That will change. And through Ezekiel, we understand that Yahuwah will gather back his people, take away their stony hearts, and give them a heart of flesh and a new spirit. In the New King James Version, there is a then at the beginning of verse 19 instead of a and. And that's an inaccurate rendering of the Hebrew vav. But I've seen people argue that Yahuwah will return the people to the land and at some later date, he will give them a new heart and a new spirit. Uh, we're 70 years and counting, and the land is still being profaned. And I'll just go right back up there. Uh, let's see. I can see that. It says, yeah, talks about uh, taking away the detestable things and all the abominations from there. And then in 19, some people say, well, then I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them as if they've okay they come back to the land they're still profaning the land and sometime afterwards he will uh, give them the one heart and put a new spirit within them so in, in other words it's okay that they're over there profaning that the land they just he brought them back they still reject Yeshua they still don't follow Torah they still follow the rabbis. They do, you know, follow this Pharisaic religion. That's okay. Eventually, he's going to put a new uh, heart, a new spirit in them. Uh, but when you when you read it as an and, it says this is all happening at the same time. He's not going to allow people to come in there and profane uh, the land uh, because that's the very reason why he he rejected them in the first place because they profaned the land. So people are really misrepresenting. Uh, the justice of Yahuwah and uh, the fact that he takes his, his commandments seriously. So that's an example of how just one word that's mistranslated can change people's entire eschatology and view of uh, end times and prophetic fulfillment. All right. <clears throat> Well, the return is obviously for people who repent and turn to Yahuwah and return to the land so that they can walk in his statutes and keep his judgments and do them. And as usual, Yahuwah expects his people to follow him and worship him in spirit and truth when they dwell in the land. And that's the reason for a new heart and a new spirit. In Ezekiel 36, uh, we, read, we read the same promise to the house of Israel concerning a new heart, a new spirit, and a return to the land immediately before the promise of a resurrection of the dry bones and the union of the two sticks that we discussed in the last message. All of this involves the new and renewed covenant promised through Jeremiah, which says, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahuwah, when I will make a new covenant, 
with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehuda, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says Yahuwah, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahuwah. I will put my Torah in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No Yahuwah, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says Yahuwah. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no, long, no more. Well, the Torah gets inside our minds and is in it's written on our hearts through a new spirit and a new heart. And Yeshua renewed the covenant of truth and sealed it with the spirit between Passover and Shavuot. And we need to participate in that covenant to receive the promise of a new heart and a new spirit. Yeshua is the door to the covenant and the only way to the Father. And that's it. Through, through Jeremiah, it was confirmed that Sinai was a wedding ceremony, and the Torah is the ketubah, the wedding contract. Yeshua performed his first recorded miracle at a wedding and showed that he came to cleanse the bride through his shed blood. As his last promised miracle, the Spirit fell upon those gathered in Jerusalem like fire, and they spoke in different languages so the people of the nations could understand the message. The purpose of all these prophetic promises involving a new heart and a new spirit is so that people can know Yahuwah and be known by him. The way the Father and the Son know you is if you are in a relationship with them. The covenant defines that relationship, and the covenant has terms and conditions that must be obeyed. If you want to be part of his bride in attendance at the wedding, then you need to abide by the terms of the covenant and show up to the wedding on time. Those are important details. There are currently people all over the spectrum following all sorts of calendars, as if the calendar that Yeshua was born into, lived within, and then died, was resurrected, and then sent the Spirit on an appointed time, was somehow corrupted. And oh, by the way, he never mentioned that fact to anyone. Well, that's just an absurd position. First, the Yahudim were only exiled, the house of Yehuda, was only exiled into Babylon for 70 years. They did not lose the mercy and their identity as a people in covenant with Yahuwah as the house of Israel did. Last week we showed how the house of Israel became lost in time and space through a punishment that spanned 2,730 years. The Yahudim, who had been exiled into Babylon, were people who understood their creator and the fact that they were being punished. Even while in exile, Ezekiel provided a clue to a jubilee year. In Ezekiel 41, it says, In the 25th year of our exile, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year, after the city was struck down, on that very day, the hand of Yahuwah was upon me and he brought me to the city. Well, for those who are familiar with, with uh, the scriptures and the Torah, well, there's only one year that begins um, on the 10th day of the month. And, and that verse says, Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month. Well, the, year be the only time the year begins on the 10th day of the month is a jubilee year when it appears on the uh, day uh, 10 of month 7. So this is very particular as far as time. Ezekiel knew exactly what time it was in comparison to their exile, in comparison to uh, when the, the city was destroyed, and that it was obviously it was keeping track of Shemitah, the Shemitah cycle of seven Sabbath years, and knew that this happened on uh, the, the, the Jubilee the beginning of the Jubilee year. So they were keeping track of time while in exile. There's no question about that. In fact, Daniel was visited by the messenger Gabriel while in exile. He was given the 70-week prophecy while praying about the end of the 70-year punishment. Here's what we read before the appearance of Gabriel. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the lineage of the Medes, 
who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the scrolls the number of the years specified by the word of Yahweh through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in uh, the desolations of Jerusalem. So he'd definitely been keeping track of time as Jeremiah kept time. Uh, he knew what time it was. Instead of straying from Yahuwah during the exile, certain Yahudim like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah maintained their focus and obedience while in, in Babylon, as well as Ezekiel, who we just talked about. Well, some exiles who returned to Jerusalem actually remembered the old temple. They were led by Ezra the priest and continued on the proper calendar when they returned. They knew what time it was. Again, Ezra was in Babylon with Ezekiel and, and Daniel and all these others. And, and they, they didn't just simply say, oh, well, we're going to adopt the Babylonian ways. And, and if, all you got to do is read Daniel. He continued to worship uh, Yah despite the fact of what, you know, the complaints and the, the, the conspiracies and the attempts to entrap him and get him killed, that's, that was the whole essence of the Daniel and the lion's den uh, story. And then, of course, we have when uh, his friends would not bow down to the image uh, that was created. So they stood their ground and they served Yahweh diligently while they were in exile. <clears throat> But anyways, they knew what time it was, and so while well, in Babylon, and they certainly knew what, what time it was when they returned. And here's an account of their celebration of the appointed times of month seven after they returned. And it says, and when the seventh month had come, so they knew how to gauge months, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. So in other words, if they knew when the seventh month was, then they knew when the year began. And, of course, they could certainly count days as well. So their calendar was fine. They were operating well under the calendar, and they knew time. And, of course, they were they were worshiping Yahuwah, and um, there's no indication, again, that their, their, their calendar was off when they returned from Babylon. They were keeping track of time, and they were worshiping Yahuwah at his appointed times. It says, Then Yeshua, the son of uh, Josadak, and his uh, that would be Yozadak, and his brother, his brother and the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren arose and built the altar of the Elohim of Israel to offer burnt offerings to it, as it is written in the Torah of Moshe, the man of Elohim. <clears throat> no fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries. They set the altar on its bases, and they offered burnt offerings on it to Yahuwah both the morning and the evening burnt offerings, uh, the Tamid offering. They also kept the Feast of Sukkot, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings in the number required by the ordinance for each day. Afterwards, they offered the regular burnt offering and those for new moons and for all the appointed feasts of Yahuwah that were consecrated and those of everyone who willingly offered a free will offering to Yahuwah. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to Yahuwah, although the foundation of the temple of Yahuwah had not been laid. And we also read about uh, that event in Nehemiah 8, and it gives a different uh, spin on things as far as the fact that they were, that people were explained uh, the instructions uh, by the priest, and it's a, it's a really great, uh, it, gives, it gives a great picture of a people who truly desired to come back and obey and were weeping when they, they realized that they had uh, missed things and, and were being restored. So are we to think that these people were uh, celebrating on the wrong calendar? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, and Yahuwah sent numerous prophets during this period of return and restoration. And they warned, they scolded and encouraged the Yahudim on many issues, but never the calendar. In fact, many of those prophets included dates when the prophecies were given. Those who say that the returning Yahudim brought back a profane Babylonian calendar are now defaming the integrity of many of those prophets. So it's a baseless argument to assert that the Yahudim were keeping time like the Babylonians while neglecting Yahweh's calendar. 
Uh, people do this to justify their solar calendars for some other or some other calendar that does not comport with Genesis 1.14. Well, Shavuot is one of the most difficult feasts for people to calculate. Well, it seems obvious to count strictly Sabbaths as weeks. That's not how Israel counted the Omer. We know how uh, Moses counted the Omer. We understand how Joshua counted the Omer. Uh, we know how Yeshua counted the Omer. And the set apart sealed the deal, so to speak. For all the evidence, I refer you to the Torah calendar article titled, How Yeshua Messiah Counts the Omer. And you can find that on the Torah calendar website. I also post it on the Shema Israel website. Imagine if you're following, if you were following some Dead Sea Scroll solar calendar and you missed the spirit as described in Acts 2. Again, the people that were out in the Dead Sea, they were, you know, condemning Jerusalem, and unlike I'd like to point out in many occasions, uh, Yeshua kept going to the house. He kept going to Jerusalem. You know, the people in the Dead Sea, they left. You know, so if you want to say they were some righteous Zedekite priesthood, well, the priest, John's father, Zechariah, was a righteous man. He was a righteous priest, and he was still serving in the temple. Even if it was profane, even if the high priests were profane, it was still the house of Elohim standing. And that's where you're supposed to meet. That's where you're supposed to bring your sacrifices. Yah doesn't just give you the right to go out and just do what you want to do uh, whenever you feel like things aren't going well uh, in Jerusalem. So anyways, they missed it, not only because of their calendar, but they missed it because they weren't where they were supposed to be. And it's an integral part of the appointed times that people need to keep in mind is that it was both time and place. You know, you're supposed to meet Yah at a certain uh, time, at a certain place, at his house. And that was the real key indicator that, that you were the people of Elohim, that Yah lived with you. And that's another issue that people seem to completely ignore, is that there has been no house of Elohim in the land of Israel for their entire existence uh, in the modern state of Israel. They, that's because they're really not concerned about it. I mean, the, the Zionists are not religious people. They don't follow Yah. They are, many of them are atheists, Leninists, communists, uh, and many agnostics. Uh, it's just, you know, the point of Israel being a people in the land is so that you know, Yah dwells with them and they can shine as a light to the nations, uh, uh, you know, a priestly nation, and that's not what we have seen. And people just, you know, just because you tack a label, again, it's not what you say, it's what you do. It's not that you call yourself Israel, it's, well, do you act like Israel? Are you serving in the capacity as Israel is supposed to? Are you in a covenant relationship with uh, the Elohim of Israel? Well, when we look back at, uh, at the incident at Acts 2, uh, people missed out if they weren't there. And there was no redo if you missed out. And that's why there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many who show up late uh, for the future wedding and get left out. This is serious stuff. People gathered in Jerusalem from all the surrounding nations for Shavuot because they were on the same calendar. They counted the Omer from the day after the first high Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the set-apart spirit confirmed that Yahuwah counted the Omer that way as well, by landing on them. He didn't say, okay, and for all of you that are going to celebrate Shavuot, next month on the other calendar, I'll show up again for that. No, there was one, there was one appointed time, and that's when the spirit fell. And, you know, you can be on any calendar you want, but if you're not on Yah's calendar, you will be missing out. That's it. End of discussion, okay? So if you don't celebrate your Shavuot, if you didn't celebrate Shavuot last week, I'm sorry to say that you missed the appointed time. And you need to thank Yahuwah that we're still rehearsing and get it right uh, next time. In fact, you'd better get it right before month seven. But showing up on time is just part of the process. Being ready when you show up is equally important. And if you're not, if you're not known by Yeshua, you won't get in, even if you're on time. Uh, last week I quoted Isaiah 49 and the prophecy of the, the servant who would raise up the tribes of Jacob and 
bring back the preserved of Israel. That servant is none other than Yeshua. He will be as a covenant for the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages. Again, so you've got to be in that renewed covenant in order to have your apportion, uh, in order to return to the land. And we refer to the fact that we should not align with those who reject the Messiah. Again, we're supposed to be a set-apart nation of priests, and we should look to the example set by the followers of Yeshua. While they continued to visit the temple in Jerusalem, while it was still standing, they left Jerusalem before it was destroyed in 70 CE. We read from Josephus' writings uh, concerning the horrors that occurred in the land during Vespasian's and Titus's assault. The important thing to understand is there were no disciples of Yeshua in the land at that time or in Jerusalem when Yahweh judged the city and the people by the hand of the Romans. Yeshua had already told them to flee and when to flee. And here's the warning from Luke. It says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in uh, the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. You notice he says this people. He's not saying there's going to be wrath upon you. He's talking to his disciples. He's, he's talking about the people around him that aren't following him. And they will fall by the edge of the sword. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles, by the nations, until the times of the nations are fulfilled. Well, the disciples of Yeshua were all well aware of this warning. And in 60 CE, 66 CE, after the beginning of the Jewish revolt, Roman governor Cestius Gallus of Syria led a Roman legion to Jerusalem, and he surrounded the city. Amazingly, he then inexplicably left after 10 days. Well, the followers of Yeshua saw this as a sign that it was time to flee, and they did. <laughs> they fled the land of Judea to the mountains across the Jordan to Pella, at Pella. The zealots, who did not follow Yeshua, misinterpreted this as a sign from Elohim, that they would have victory over the Roman oppressors. Uh, they did not follow Yeshua's advice. Uh, thing they, the way they saw it, hey, everything's great. Look, Rome came, but they left, so we're all set. Uh, Yeshua's followers, uh, they saw, oh boy, remember when the master said, when you see it surrounded, we got to leave? Well, uh, they then left because they saw that sign. Well, the zealots didn't file, follow Yeshua's advice. They stayed in the land and continued to go to Jerusalem for the feast. And their struggle ended in a terrible defeat with horrific results that Yeshua alluded to in his original warning concerning the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem that we read about in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21. And it's amazing how two different groups of people who claim to follow Yahuwah could be so diametrically opposed to one another. And the critical difference was the Messiah, those who believed and obeyed the Messiah and those who did not. The followers of Yeshua were not standing with the two major factions in Jerusalem, led by Simon bar Joris and uh, John of Gishala, uh, nor, were there, uh, nor were they aligned with the Edomians or the Zealots who were fighting against the Romans. The followers of Yeshua heeded his words and followed his advice. If they had chosen to stand with Yehuda, then they would have been decimated along with the rest of the people. Instead, they were gone out of the path of destruction. Uh, the Romans later began the attack, and like I said, I mentioned what happened in 66 CE. That allowed time uh, for the Yahudim to, uh, that followed Yeshua to leave. And then later on, uh, Vespasian with Titus came and started decimating the Galilee and moving their way down to Jerusalem. 
until on April 14, 70 CE, under Titus's leadership, uh, Jerusalem was sieged. Uh, according to TorahCalendar.com, that was also Passover. Well, they were not covered by the blood of the Lamb of Elohim and were therefore destined for judgment. The siege lasted around four months, and on August 5th, 70 CE, the final Tamid offering was slaughtered in the temple. This was none other than day nine of month five, commonly referred to as uh, Tisha B'Av, uh, the ninth of Av. The destruction of Jerusalem did not end the rebellion, though. Some zealots sought refuge in the Herodian fortress at Masada. Again, they didn't heed Yeshua's advice. Instead, they sought refuge in a Roman fortress. Uh, I guess you could say the Iron Dome of Rome, if you catch my drift. Uh, instead of under the shadow of the Almighty. Well, they all died at Masada. It's a sad story of defeat and judgment that the modern state of Israel attempts to turn turn around by holding these people up as heroes, and that completely misses the point. Uh, you cannot outrun or hide from the judgment of Yahuwah. Your, your defiance against Yahuwah will end up in destruction. And this is consistent with the Zionist approach to the land. It ignores the prophets of Yahuwah, and it ignores the Messiah and attempts to achieve its desires through defiance. Uh, the events at Masada are a prime example of what happens when we, sp we stray from Elohim's commandments. They, they, show, they should be viewed in the context of judgment and curses, not, not heroism. And I filmed a video from Masada on that point many years ago uh, titled Remembering Judgment at Passover. And... Uh, uh, that's on my YouTube channel. And it's interesting that really uh, the judgment began at Passover in 70 CE as well. Uh, it had to be ironic for those Yahudim on top of Masada during the Roman siege. They could look down at the remnants of Sodom and Gomorrah below them as they were about to receive the wrath of Elohim through the Romans. They could also look across the Dead Sea to the mountains where the followers of Yeshua fled to safety. Uh, there were no followers of Yeshua at Masada either. They did not stand with uh, Yehuda. Instead, they obeyed Yeshua. There's a typo there. I'll have to fix that. Um, yeah, they did not stand with Yehuda. Instead, they obeyed Yeshua. Tish B'Av, the ninth of Av, was not only the day when the Romans destroyed the temple, uh, five calamities are actually commemorated on this traditional fast day, namely uh, the ten spies uh, giving the bad report, uh, the destruction of Solomon's temple uh, by the Babylonians, the destruction of Herod's temple by the Romans, uh, the crushing of the Bar Kokhba revolt and destroying the city of Betar, and five uh, following the Bar Kokhba revolt, Roman commander Quintus uh, Tineus Rufus plowed uh, the site of the temple in Jerusalem and the surrounding area. Well, did you notice that the final three events directly resulted from rejecting a Messiah, Yeshua? Uh, it's important to note that Ye Yeshua's followers did not stand with Bar Kokhba and Akiba during the second Jewish revolt either. Why would they? It was all a rejection of Yeshua and defiance of his authority. They knew that Akiba was wrong and Bar Kokhba was a false messiah, and they both rejected Yeshua as the messiah. So uh, they didn't stand with, you know, the, in, during the first revolt or the second revolt, they didn't stand with Yehuda. They followed Yeshua. Well, this is very similar to the circumstances we find ourselves in today. There is a nation occupying the land that calls itself Israel, and specifically continues to reject Yeshua as the Messiah. They have not had any peace as they forcibly attempt to take the covenant land without being in the covenant renewed by Yeshua. <clears throat> well, we should not be joining with the Jews who reject the Messiah in their quest to take and keep the covenant land without Yeshua. We must make the same decision to separate as our predecessors in the faith did. We must continue to obey Yeshua and follow his commandments, understanding that those who hear the voice of the Good Shepherd are the lost sheep of the house of Israel being called home. Of course, much of this comes down to the identity of Israel. 
It's not a genetic definition. Instead, it's a covenant definition. So who is Yisrael? Well, we already discussed it at the beginning of this message. They are the ones who received the promise of the Father through the covenant renewed by Yeshua. The Spirit has sealed them through belief in Yeshua so they can have circumcised hearts. They want to obey. The act of circumcision involved the removal of flesh. It pointed to the fact that the physical flesh is not essential. There was a part that could be cut off and thrown away because it pointed to a more critical spiritual change inside of us. And this is why we've got to get past all this you know, Jewish DNA versus non-Jewish DNA and, and looking at DNA you know, to your, your, your mother, who your mother was, determines if you're special or not. None of this matters in the long run. While Adam was made in the image of Yahuwah, we were all born in the image of Adam. And the Israelites were not born circumcised. They were born uncircumcised, just like all of the nations. There was nothing different from them physically except for the journey of the seed and the covenant they were born into. The seed needed to pass through the cutting of the covenant, and it, all, it took three generations to get to the point where the seed passed from a male circumcised on the eighth day to a male that would be circumcised on the eighth day. And that's why Yahuwah is the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who later became Israel. The Israelites had to be circumcised on the eighth day of their life to be in the covenant. They were completely reliant upon their parents to circumcise their flesh, just as we are entirely reliant upon our Father to circumcise our hearts. Of course, the eighth day happens to be the name of the final appointed time in the annual cycle of appointed times. Many people think it is simply the eighth day of Sukkot, but Sukkot is only a seven-day feast. Uh, the eighth day, Shemini Etzeret, lands on uh, day 22 of month 7. It is the, the Ta of the month, while Yom Teruah is the Aleph of month 7. Yeshua was born on Yom Teruah. And we can expect a great covenant fulfillment on a future eighth day, Shemini Etzeret. And that's the goal of the covenant journey we're all on, guided through the cycle of the appointed times. Uh, keep that in mind as we pass from Shavuot to the appointed times of month 7. We're physically observing commandments so that we can be changed on the inside. Last week we talked about the 40 days at the beginning of Yeshua's ministry, as well as the 40 days at the end. And those 40 days were pointing us back to Moses and the mountain. It's essential to recognize that we don't stop counting after Shavuot. On day 50, Yahuwah came down and spoke the ten words in his voice through the sound of the shofar. And shortly after that, Moses ascended the mountain of Elohim. He ascended and descended for three different periods, 40-day periods, leading up to Yom Kippur. 120 days on the mountain to get to Yom Kippur and atonement. Remember that a jubilee year begins on Yom Kippur, and that is a fantastic and purposeful connection. The completion of 120 jubilee years points to the year 6,000 from creation. And that's why some believe Yeshua will return at the beginning of a jubilee year and descend from the clouds like Moses descended from the mountain on Yom Kippur. There's a great shofar blast blown on Yom Kippur as well. Someday it may be announcing the return of the king to judge the nations. With that in mind, I hope that you all had a wonderful Shavuot, and I encourage you to keep counting because the journey isn't over. These exercises and observances are meant to keep us focused on what really matters. And ultimately, it comes down to the fact that Yahuwah is looking for true worshipers, those who worship in spirit and truth. And the only way to do this is through a circumcised heart. And that is why we must stay focused on time and the appointed times that lead us to the eighth day. Barakot, my name is Todd Bennett from Shema Israel. Shalom.